Hello and welcome to this tutorial. We are going to look into something called NAT. Now NAT is a service which has been so widely deployed and, and is so common on networks all around the world that it is highly likely that you have used NAT before, even if you didn't realize it. When you were perhaps jumping online at work or at school or at home and you were going to access a resource somewhere on the internet, like a web server for instance. So what is NAT? Well, quite simply, like the name suggests, it is a translation service for IP addresses. And NAT was initially introduced in order to help conserve the public IP version 4 addresses because we've talked about how there weren't all that many IP version 4 public addresses as it turned out and they started to get depleted very quickly. Well, NAT was one of the reasons, uh, one of the solutions rather, to combating that, that quick depletion of IP version 4 addresses, the public addresses. Now, there are many other uses to NAT as well. Uh, for instance, if you're merging two networks or you're migrating a network, NAT can be used uh, you know, to make that transition easier. And as we get into the details of how NAT works, you'll see exactly why that is and how that's possible. Okay, so let's move on to look, taking a look at how NAT actually works. Now, it's very useful to understand IP addresses and the concept of ports before we jump into the details of NAT. And so here we have my PC and we have a web server. And whenever two PCs or two layer three devices initiate some kind of communication between themselves, they use an IP address and they use a port. And the port is a way to distinguish a particular service on a server or a PC. So for instance, in this scenario, my PC is contacting the web server. And the web server has an IP address of 205.5.5.1. And the web server itself, that program running on the web on the server, is listening on port 80. And so when my PC contacts it, not only does it say which IP address it's going to, but it states which port it's going to. So when the web server receives my packets, it knows exactly what service I'm interested in. Because this web server can be doing many other things. In fact, there are many different ports which are reserved for very uh, for the, the many common services we use online all the time. So for instance, port 21 is dedicated to FTP, and 22 is dedicated to SSH, 53, for instance, is DNS, 80 is HTTP, 25 is SMTP. So this web server could be running many different other services. So when my PC contacts it, if it didn't include the port information, the web server wouldn't really know what service I'm interested in. Likewise, when the web server returns traffic to me, I've included a source port when I contacted it. And obviously it knows my source address. So when it sends information back to me, not only does it say, I'm going to send it to your IP address, but it includes the port that I used to send it to it initially, to contact it initially. That way, when I receive information back from the web server, I can distinguish it. I know what program on my PC is interested in that information. Okay, And because my PC clearly could be contacting many things online. I could be contacting 10 different websites at once. You know, we have many browsers open. I could have an FTP session going to one or uh, one of those web servers or a different server completely. Okay, so the, the idea of IP addresses and ports is quite simply to not only let somebody know you're interested in talking to them, but you're telling them exactly what you're interested in talking about. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at NAT. Okay, so real quickly, if we look at a, another example of not using NAT, here, if my PC, which is down here, has a public IP, wants to contact this web server, when the web server starts to receive packets from me, it's going to see a source address, that's what SA stands for, of my PC, and it's going to see the source port I'm using in order to identify this particular session for my PC. And that makes sense because now the web server can send back and it's going to send it 
to this combination. So when it gets back to me, uh, my PC knows, hey, I got traffic not only from the web server, but it's for this particular uh, uh, this particular program as identified by the port I'm using. Well, let's say I'm not using public IPs on all of my PCs. And here we have a local area network using the 192.168 class C RFC 1918 space. Well, what happens in this particular scenario? First, my PC, which now has this IP address, which is private, is going to source some packets destined for the web server. And initially, they're going to look like this, a source address of the private IP along with the port number my PC chose to identify the session. Now when the router gets that packet, it's going to realize that based on its NAT configurations, that traffic coming in this interface that is supposed to be routed out that interface has to be NATed. And think about that, because if the web server got these packets using the 192 information, it would not be able to route back to it because public, uh, rather private IPs are not routed over the internet. So the router is going to go ahead and it's going to make some changes. So when it forwards these packets, it's going to insert a new source address, and here it's using the one configured on the interface of router A, and it's going to have, in this case, it'll use the same source port, but doesn't have to. So the router is creating what is known as the NAT table, and it keeps track of all the different combinations of, of communications, all the different conversations. And so it would enter this information in one of these rows here. And so the web server would now receive packets from my PC. However, they're going to look like this. They're going to look like they're sourced from 170.7.7.1 with this particular source port. And that's because when the web server responds back, it can actually route to that IP because it's a public IP. When now router A receives the return traffic from the web server, it's going to look up into its NAT table again and say, okay, I see what, I see this particular conversation. I know I need to change the IP information back. And it will then go ahead and change the IP headers again so that the, the packets are then sent to the private IP address of my PC along with the source port. So my PC gets the packets. It thinks that it came straight from the web server, but in fact the router did some translation services in the meantime. And of course the web server thinks that you know it got packets straight from my PC. However, the router is also changing them around. So that's NAT. That is the actual translation that is applied to the private IP in order to make it look like it's coming from a public IP. And because of this, we can then talk to devices over the Internet, even though my PC has a private IP address. All right. Well, now that we know the basic concepts behind NAT, let's look at a few of the different flavors or types of NAT. And the first one is dynamic. Now, the reason why it's called dynamic is the router will be configured with what is known as a pool of IP addresses. So here it has a, a range of public IP addresses, 170.7.7.1, all the way up to and including .20. And so here, whenever a PC on the network needs to access something over the Internet or out that particular interface, the router will go ahead and draw upon these particular IPs and assign it to each one. And so it's a dynamic translation. This PC down here does not always get the same IP, and this one does not always get the same IP either. That's why it's called dynamic, and there's a pool of IPs to be used, and the router has you know management over that pool. Okay, so that's dynamic net. So the opposite of dynamic NAT is static NAT. And the reason why it's called static NAT is that the translations, the IP address translations on the router are hard-coded. They're configured so that each time my PC here, for instance, contacts anything that's being routed out this interface, it's always going to get the same IP address. And the same thing with any other uh, PC on this network using a static translation. Here, 
2.6 is always going to get this public IP. So this is a different approach. It's not chosen uh, through uh, a pool. It's actually uh, hard-coded on the router, and that is static NAT. Okay, the third and last type of NAT is often called PAT or NAT overload. And so PAT stands for Port Address Translation. So what happens in this particular approach is we're only going to use one IP to hide all of our private IPs behind. So this PC and this PC, when they talk to anything that has to be routed out this interface, like this web server, for instance, they're both going to use the same IP address. And the way that works is it'll look something like this. If both of these PCs were to contact the web server at the same time, the web server would see the same public IP address here because we're using just this one. However, the source ports would be different for each session. And so the return traffic from the web server to both of these PCs, when the router gets it, it'll look up into its NAT table again, and it'll decode based on the different ports assigned. So that's how it knows how to translate them back to the proper private IPs and send them back. This is sometimes referred to as PAT or sometimes referred to as NAT overload. Um, you may hear the terms used interchangeably. Uh, essentially, it just means that you're really translating not only the IP address, but the port numbers as well. Okay, so that's the third and final type of NAT that you'll often come across. All right, well, hang in there because we're almost finished. The last thing we need to cover are some terms that are often used when we talk about NAT. The first term is called inside local. And when you hear somebody talk about the inside local address, they're really talking about the IP address of a host. So in this instance, these would be your inside local IP addresses. The next term is called inside global, and that is the IP that's used to represent your inside local IP addresses. So you might be able to guess what that is. That's this one here. That's your inside global, because when these IPs are translated, they're hidden behind this guy here. So generally, your inside global is going to be a public IP, and your inside local will oftentimes be private IPs. Now, there are two other terms. We're not going to get too deeply into them, but there's one called the outside local, and that's the destination host, let's say the web server, before any sort of translation occurs. And then there's a fourth and final term called the outside global. And that's the same destination host, but after translation has occurred. So what we're getting at here is not only can you translate sources, but you can also translate destination IPs with NAT. That's a little bit outside of the scope of what we're going to be working on, but just know that it exists. The two terms you should be familiar with now are inside local and inside global. And congratulations, we are at the end of this tutorial. Let's summarize what we talked about. We now know that NAT is all about address translation, usually from a private to a public IP. And we now know that IP addresses and ports are used together, they're combined, it's a combination in order to not only tell a device um, you're going to talk to it, but also what particular service you want to talk about, and that's identified by the port. We also now know that there are a few different types of NAT. There's dynamic NAT, where we choose from a pool of IP addresses to hide our private IPs. There's static NATs, which we have a configured one-to-one -one mapping between the public and the private IPs, and those don't change. And then we have PAT, sometimes called Port Address Translation or NAT Overload, because you're only using one IP, and really the, the IP and the port are being translated here. That's why you get the port or the pat name as well. And then finally, we talked about some terms, inside local and inside global, as well as outside local and outside global. Okay, so that's it. That is the introduction to NAT. Thanks for watching.